you. Welcome, welcome. I'm so happy today to have a friend on. Um, and his name is Robert Jones. And um, before, um, before I set the stage for what we're going to talk about, I'd like to properly introduce him. Uh, full disclosure, he was my brother's roommate when all of us lived in Boston. Um, and he went to MIT as well. Um, he got his undergraduate degree from MIT. I believe it was chemical engineering. Yeah, chemical engineering, same major as your brother. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then he went to Harvard Graduate School of Business and he got his MBA. And he opened a restaurant called Caribbeana in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and it did very well. Mm -hmm. Actually, I remember uh, we had a few gatherings there. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And uh, it's very interesting. He's now a social investor in engineering for kids um, at New York City Bronx. So um, you've done a lot of interesting work. And I am going to be asking you something else about some of your credentials uh, that I was curious about later in our interview. But sure. welcome, welcome. And uh, I'll just set the stage for what these interviews are about. I've been interviewing people to uh, try to help the community, especially people of color and melanated people to find out more about what they can do about avoiding um, and surviving if they get COVID-19 or coronavirus, and then also thriving um, after we get past this pandemic as a people. So, all right, so Robert, can you tell me about the work that you do at the organization um, in the Bronx for kids in engineering? Okay, yes, um, engineering for kids. Um, it is a uh, franchise organization and um, its focus is providing engineering enrichment to elementary and middle school students. Um, I've been doing this uh, about seven years now, and um, I started the franchise in the Bronx. And, um, you know, it has been a lot of uh, fun. You know, it's uh, part of my way to um, give back and to also meet a urgent national need in terms of the country developing more um, engineers, doctors, um, you know, uh, Folks of color, you know, um, um, need to participate more in in STEM related uh, careers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's awesome, um, and I was just so happy to find out um, that you're still doing that because I knew you were doing some of that before. Um, and I wanted to also ask you, um, in looking at your CV, I saw that you had LEED uh, certification. Back in 2012, can you can you tell me about what that's about? Lead green um, in 2012. Yeah, all that all that um, that's about is um, one of the basic certifications that um, anyone can actually get um, concerning um, having a more sustainable world. You know. Being a chemical engineer, you know, I've been part of that whole revolution in terms of introducing new materials, you know, but um, one of the things that we didn't focus enough on is, um, you know, what is the impact to the environment, you know, and are we being totally responsible in terms of making sure that that what we do is sustainable in the long run. Um, so that's why I um, decided to, to get that sort of certification on my own and anyone can do it. Uh, it's just a oh. matter of actually, um, you know, going on the LEED web website and um, saying that you want to go through a course of study and it actually tells you all the things that you need to study and then you take a exam. <laughs> yeah, and then you get certified, you know. Oh, wow. And, um, okay. So that's something that, that I did entirely on my own, you know. And, um, you know, it just gives you certain 
credentials, um, you know, in the whole field of uh, sustainability. And I just also happened to be at a time when um, I was involved with a um, with a um, solar um, finance project um, in Jamaica. And I was on the board of the directors of that company and it provided credibility, you know, when actually talking about um, financing uh, solar I installations for, um, you know, medium sized and, and, um, and large sized uh, companies. You know, so um, sustain sustainability is very important to me. I think that's why that caught my eye. <laughs> I, was, I was curious about it. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I don't know if you remember Adrian, Dr. Adrian Hollis. Uh, she used to be my roommate when we lived in Boston. I remember the name. Yes. Yeah, I interviewed her a couple of weeks ago. She, um, in addition to her PhD in um, nutritional biochemistry and her work in toxicology, she now has a law degree from Rutgers. Mm. Um, so I had her on Earth Week, um, and they've actually found um, the research is showing already that um, the areas with the highest density of COVID cases are actually being, or have been subject to the highest levels of air pollution. Mm. So air pollution seems to be like a predisposition uh, for people suffering, you know, at a higher level from uh, COVID, um, a higher level of acuity. So that's really relevant and mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'm glad that uh, you did that, and it's good to know that other people can do it, and hopefully, yeah. hopefully it's not too expensive. I'm sure they make it affordable, right? Uh, it's not bad. I mean, given the, given the benefits, it's, it's, uh, it's reasonable. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's definitely reasonable. Because really, I think all businesses, uh, no matter what sector they're in, need to pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I think, was it you that was saying that you're completely paperless now? No, it wasn't me, but um, I, I, I definitely believe in that. <laughs> and I'm moving towards that. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm moving towards that as well. I'm pretty much completely paperless um, in my practice, but um, sometimes you have to, um, you know, you have to, copy copy something to mm -hmm. give someone a copy of so i still have a copy of machine all right can you tell me so uh one of the main reasons i wanted to get on here get you on here was because we had a discussion the other day about your personal experience uh during this covid crisis mm -hmm. and um thank goodness you have not suffered from covid however um some friends of mine that are in healthcare and I have noticed a trend um, with some melanated people and other people too being taken advantage of, unfortunately, by people in the medical field. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if you can tell me about your recent experience with the medical system during the COVID crisis. Sure, you know, um, this was um, in March, um, New York City uh, or, or, or the New York uh, State had its, had its first case around March 1st. And, um, and the hotspot, um, as many people know, was based in a suburb um, called New, New Rochelle. Um, I live in Mount Vernon, which is adjacent to um, New Rochelle. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, but I had very close contact to that hotspot because um, the actual site of the um, of the um, I'm I'm trying to get the word now um, of the uh, Jewish Jew, Jewish temple. Um, yeah, and I think there was a patient zero. Right, patient zero. Right, right. but that but that actual temple place of place of worship that was the source of the hot hot spot mm -hmm. was, was only a quarter of a mile away 
from where I took my son tw um, three times a week, um, um, two times a week for his Taekwondo practice and once a week for his, um, his uh, tutoring. Um, so we were very much aware of the, of the dangers, you know. And um, so, um, you know, so I was very attuned to what was, to what was going, going on. And it just so happened that um, March 18th, I had a, a appointment to see one of my specialists. And, um, and it was basically to get a, a prescription um, of, um, for supplies that I normally get. You know, mm -hmm. so I had, um, so when I'd call the office um, prior to the, to the appointment, about, about a week before, you know, I, I really pressed and said, you know, is it really necessary for me to be physically there? Can this be done on the phone? Uh, but the staff said, no, you know, you have to come in. And then um, the day before the appointment, I even called again, just to verify that my appointment was still on, you know, given you know, all that was going on, you know, because this was, this was in a town right next to New Rochelle, you know, which is a well-known hotspot. And was this in March or April? When was it? Uh, no, this was March. This was, um, this was, the appointment, appointment was in March 18th, you know, okay. for reference, my school system was actually shut down on March 13th. You know, yeah, five days we earlier. Were, we were in New Jersey. We were shut down as well. And New York was shut down. Right. right exactly. For a point of reference. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. right exactly. So the day before I called and, um, I, I just, and just said, hey, you know, I'm very weary, but I'm going to come in. You mm -hmm. know, um, will the doctor be wearing a mask? You know, and, and, and the staff said, yes. You know, they, re, they reassured me. So I went in, and um, and uh, when I went in, the staff was wearing masks, you know, and you know, and I saw the saw the um, the the stuff that you put on your hands, you know, and you know everything looked good, and they um, said that the doctor is uh, will be a little bit late um, because he's coming back from the hospital. You know, and he's running a, a little bit late. You know, so oh, I said, wow. okay. Mm -hmm. And um, and they and they ushered me into the into the um, um, into the room where the doctor sees you. And I sat there waiting. And then the doctor came in about half an hour late. Um, you know, no big deal. But I was very struck that the doctor did not have a mask. You know, so I asked the doctor, um, excuse me. Um, would you be wearing a mask? You know, and the doctor looked at me and said, why? And I said, um, social distancing, you know, I mean, you know, that was like a new term. And um, he said, no, he said, uh, there's no need for that because, because apparently you look well, you know, I'm well. And I just couldn't believe that I was hearing that from a doctor. Just for a point I mean, of reference, what, what race or ethnicity was the doctor? Um, he, he was Caucasian, male, mm -hmm. Caucasian, and, um, you know, and I just couldn't believe what I, what I heard. I mean, you know, anyone following COVID, you know, should have understood by, by now that there are uh, uh, folks who may have the virus and show no symptoms, you yeah. know, and, and to make it even worse, you know, knowing that the doctor is going back and forth from a hospital. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I didn't even get that from your story. Wow. You know, made me yeah. very apprehensive, you know, but, but, but the doctor saw my concern and he tried to uh, mitigate that concern, but he even made things worse because he even came closer to me. And he walked by me and actually picked up my briefcase. And I was telling him, what? I mean, that, that is my briefcase. What, and he didn't why have it up? Him. You know, and, and, then, and then he explained to me, because he was moving, moving the chairs around to ensure that we are six feet apart. But he should have told me that he was going to do that. 
you know, prior to doing it. So, you know, so that was a very rough start for a, for a doctor's you visit. You didn't have gloves on, right? No gloves. <laughs> and, and like, I mean, you would think that the staff would have placed things the way that, you know. Well, well, well he indicated that, uh, that the prior um, day, I guess, you know, um, the, the, uh, the room was laid out such that he had a six foot um, um, distance between he and uh, patients. But for whatever reason, I was the first patient for that, for that day. And, and, and the room wasn't properly la laid out. But I didn't know that. I mean, I, I'm, just, I'm just going by, you know, by but plus, interaction. You, the six foot thing is with a mask. <laughs> because if you speak, cough, or sneeze, then the aerosolized particles, they say, can hang in the air for, for three hours and it can project further. Well, I didn't, I didn't learn that until later. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, it was a study that I saw done at um, MIT later that month. Mm -hmm. it even, it indicated that the, that the six foot rule, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, might not be adequate, you know. They they had studies that actually show that the that the that the droplets, you know, mm -hmm. under certain circumstances like sneezing, could actually travel a, as far as twenty six feet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we we've kind of known that from TV, okay, from long ago, like in other respiratory illnesses. So got doctors it. should know that. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Got yeah. It. So so that was my experience. Um, for the first half of the interview, there was another part of it that um, that I'd like to share, mm -hmm. and that is um, the doctor then started to ask me questions about my um, experience, you know, with my with my medical um, issue, mm -hmm. and uh, started asking me certain details, and I was kind of wondering why he was asking those things because my condition is one where the technology setup um, transmits information mm -hmm. um, to a central database mm -hmm. um, um, once a day. You know, I mean, I mean, I mean, very detailed info. Mm -hmm. So it was my assumption mm -hmm. that the doctor had pulled the report, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and could easily answer the questions that he was asking me. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so I so mainly I, what you were there for, <laughs> and also, I mean, just as a physician myself, knowing that that even more reinforced that it could have been done uh, by telemedicine, right? Remotely, yes, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. yes, 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 and you know, and and also, to I am very sensitive towards um, um, information. You know, um, you know, if, if um, I mean, doctors and others getting that detailed information from you, you know, at least you should get the benefits of the of the efficiency mm -hmm. from from such a process, you know. Mm -hmm. So so that's what I was reacting to when I stopped the doctor and said, hey, doctor, I mean, don't you have the report? You know, mm -hmm. and then he said, no, he said that, um, you know, he has over 1100 patients and, and that he doesn't necessarily have the time to pull the report down for, for, for every patient. And that's when I just stopped him. I just said, no, that is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And that's what I told him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I told him my expectation is um, this is a appointment that was scheduled long in, long in, in advance, right? Mm -hmm. And your staff had sufficient time to actually pull down the report and present it to you before you came in to see me. Mm -hmm. So I just carefully let him know mm -hmm. what my expectations were. And then he just paused because I guess he realized that I was totally right. Mm -hmm. And he did exactly what I told him. He mm -hmm. actually um, called in his assistant asked uh, the assistant to pull the report and the assistant did that and within three minutes he had the report and he looked at it and um and then he started to share that report with me did he by chance apologize no he did not 
um, verbally apologize, but, uh, but through his actions, mm -hmm. he, through his course correction, it mm -hmm. was very clear that he realized that um, I was right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, what's upsetting to me though, is that I know like people like our parents mm -hmm. will not advocate for themselves as forcefully as we will. Right. Um, and also children, you know, so it was. Well, 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 let me, well, let me push back on that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, my parent, well, my mother, um, mm -hmm. I learned from her <laughs> to um, advocate, okay. but mm -hmm. she has a, um, a medical um, background you know um, that makes a big difference right right mm -hmm. right you know versus my dad now um he is uh he has passed but um he wasn't as um uh, aggressive in terms of um you know protecting his um his rights and and um and and asking the questions you know to, mm -hmm. to make doctors understand that um they had better come with their a game when mm. dealing with you <laughs> <laughs> or your family yeah. <laughs> right 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 but um but that's something that i learned you know from my from my from my mom you know my mom you know when i was young you know like um teens you know she would just say hey robert um what is the problem and then i would tell her and then and she said, well this is what you need to tell a doctor mm -hmm. both of us are going in but mm -hmm. I am purposely not going to speak. I'm going to let you speak, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, so, uh, you know, so you had, another, you had to top that off. You had another experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah just, was that in March too, or was that in April? Yeah, that was in March. That was uh, about uh, 12 days later, you okay. know, and, um, and I had contacted another specialist um through um through a secure email system mm -hmm. um you know asking the doctor for a um um bottom line is that um i also work in the local school system where where i live and um they were seeking um staff members to basically cover um a, a daycare arrangement that they had for children of first responders and um and i know that i have a chronic um condition that um could put me at risk for mm -hmm. complications if i were to get covid 19. so i just simply asked the um specialist saying hey you know this is a situation where where my job wants me to to um to to do but i don't think it's in my best um you know interest from a medical point of view um could you just write me a brief note you know? mm -hmm. and i was very surprised um that the that the specialist responded back in writing um stating um their opinion that um that because of some technicality in terms of the drugs that I was taking, the specialist did not believe that I was at higher risk um, than the average person. And um, immediately, <laughs> alarm bells went out because um, COVID-19 is called a novel coronavirus. Novel means new, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. So I instantly knew, knew that 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 the specialist is basing their opinion, and the opinion probably has no clinical results to to actually ground it. <laughs> right, no research to back it up. <laughs> right, yeah. and I said, uh uh. <laughs> and there there had already been a public warning about people with pre-existing chronic conditions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, um, and the fact that the um, specialists had put um, their opinion in writing, you know, kind of indicated to me that, hey, 
I don't think that this person can be convinced otherwise. So I just said, you know what? Let me just go to my um, to to my primary care doctor, explain the situation, and my primary care agreed with me. <laughs> you know that no no no, <laughs> yeah you, you don't want to be taking that uh, taking that risk. You know, and the primary care wrote me the the um, the note. You know, so again, you know, fact well, is that you if you don't necessarily just for uh, agree. Another. Yeah, just to, for the point, okay. uh, the race or ethnicity of this physician. Caucasian female. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, you know. So yeah. um, yeah. again, you know, and, and, and um, on my primary care, care uh, doctor um, who provided me a note was a doctor of color. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, so... Um, it's it's just very interesting, you know, having these um, Experience. experiences at vital times, mm -hmm. you know, when the quality of care matters so much, when yes. stakes are so high, you know. Yes. So I, 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 it it really shook me. Mm -hmm. It really shook me, you know. And I said, "Hmm, mm -hmm. interesting." Yeah, and just for the education of people that are watching this who may be patients, um, what concerns me about what's going on with this, um, number one, it's, it's in New York, you know, and this area of the Northeast, I'm in New Jersey, uh, there are more cases than other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. So the telemedicine piece with healthcare is very, very important. And uh, there are free applications that doctors can use um, and other healthcare providers can use for delivering telemedicine. And the states have relaxed the rules. Um, so there's really no excuse. Um, and I, you know, most doctors, I, I don't know of a doctor that doesn't have a computer at home. Um, some may not have them in their offices, you know, some older physicians, but everybody has a computer, everybody has a smartphone, and these applications can be used on a smartphone, and they can be used, um, you know, on your PC, they can be used on a laptop, and uh, you may not know this, but I interviewed uh, my brother Bobby, uh, because he's, uh, at his hospital, he's like the telemedicine guru or expert. Mm -hmm or czar or whatever you want to call it. So he's in charge uh, of, you know, since COVID, um, he had been in charge of it anyways, but then since COVID, they wanted him to ramp it up and get it online within a couple of weeks of mm -hmm. the start of COVID so that they would be prepared once it got to Texas um, to see their patients, you know, by telemedicine. So, and I actually have heard multiple stories from multiple friends of mine who are providers and their parents were, their, the parents were being, you know, like the, their providers and clinicians were trying to convince them to come in. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a difference. This, this may change in some states and I think it's changing right now, like in the Northeast states, but the reimbursement for telemedicine visits was lower than in person. And that was a pre-existing problem with the system. But um, now it's being fixed in many states. But I just want people to be conscious of that, that there's a financial driver um, for some of these places trying to get people to come in person, even though it's endangering people's lives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. So, you know, you, you know, the interesting thing is that my um, primary care f f physician is old school. He doesn't do the computers, you know, but yep. nevertheless, in the pinch, he, he was the one who came through, you know, I had to tell him, you know, simply just write the letter on, on, mm -hmm. on your, on your stationery. Mm -hmm. Take a picture of it, yeah. you know, with your phone. Okay. Just and just text it to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and apparently that was the first time 
he had ever done that. <laughs> you know, but it worked. <laughs> Well, there are a lot of HIPAA rules that I'm sure they'll put back in place after the uh, crisis is over, mm -hmm. uh, where you have to have like special accommodations for using technology mm -hmm. and making sure that it's HIPAA compliant, but mm -hmm. it's available and it's widely available. It's just that some doctors don't know about it. Mm -hmm. But if they go on like the CDC website, on their state medical websites, mm -hmm. they can find the information about telemedicine, about texting, about using the phone, about using smart technology. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad you asked me about that because then if someone is watching this or if they're a patient, they can help their doctor by mm -hmm. telling them to go to the website to look up the information. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you want people to just know from what we've talked about and about advocating for themselves in the medical system in general, not even just during this pandemic, but just in general? I mean, in general, you know, try and, um, you know, don't uh, hesitate to um get second opinions you know and uh, and you could even start with not with not necessarily going formally to another doctor i mean if you just happen to have friends you know who might be doctors and um not necessarily someone in in the in the specialty you know mm -hmm. just just talking talk in general you know you can't lose. <laughs> you can't lose. Or a nurse, or a, nurse, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, just just um, just realize, you know, what their qualifications are, and just keep that in mind as you hear the information. Mm -hmm. um, but but I've always learned that um, getting more information never hurts. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there there are actually. Um, websites that are like their telemedicine that are really inexpensive mm -hmm. um, that you pay cash for and you can get a second opinion or ask someone if you don't have someone to ask you can you know pay 40 or 50 dollars mm -hmm. and ask talk to a doctor online you know it'll be a random doctor but sometimes you can get specialists too Mm -hmm. um, and ask questions if you don't trust what you're being told. Right. And, you know, there's like Web and WebMD. There's um, Mayo Clinic has a website that's a really good reference. And you just type in whatever your issue is. And you can, you know, we don't want you to try to act like you're a doctor online, but the information is widely available mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and accessible on the cell phone or accessible on a computer. Right. And, and um, you know, and um, I, I just add, you know, yes, you know, you can do your own research online first, you know, because usually having that knowledge helps you in your conversation with the with the doctors, you know, mm -hmm. and, and when doctors um, and you can tell me this, but but if you, you know, have a patient coming in who, who it is very clear that they have done some research, you know, I think that um, that the that the conversation, you know, um, um, is usually richer, mm -hmm. and um, and 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 the doctor can cover a lot more ground mm -hmm. uh, if the patient has certain background info. That's true, and I will I will temper what the pa you know the patient. Um, what they're trying to accomplish in an office visit. Mm -hmm. If you're using health insurance, um, on average, you're going to get somewhere between six and 10 minutes with a doctor that you're following up with. Mm -hmm. um, and so six to 10 minutes is not really enough time to evaluate a new problem. Mm. So if you have a new problem, you know, bring it up to the doctor, um, follow what the doctor says. Sometimes the doctor has some flexibility and may be able to extend your time by like five minutes, but it will realize it's putting stress on the doctor for mm -hmm. that doctor's day, mm -hmm. uh, but be willing to book another appointment and come mm -hmm. back in. Um, and you may have to spread it over several appointments because mm -hmm. the system is just dysfunctional right now. 
Mm. Um, even a new patient only gets around 15 to 20 minutes. That's not enough time um, to evaluate a problem, really. Um, and so, I mean, that's what I, that's why I do what I do. I'm in a, I do a holistic um, type of medicine. I do functional medicine, integrative medicine. And our initial visits are typically um, 90 minutes to a couple of hours mm. uh, because we ask a lot of questions. We have people fill out questionnaires and we talk to our patients for quite a while to mm. try to understand not only the medical issue, but what people don't understand, it's like the psychosocial, it's like, what's your family situation? Where are you living? What are you eating? You know, all these lifestyle factors feed into what's happening with the body. Mm -hmm. You're expecting that type of care. Um, that type of care um, is not fully covered by insurance. You may find some providers uh, that will bill insurance, but generally insurance is going to pay for the amount of time that they feel, you know, that's designated in their books with certain problems. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. So, so, um, so patients need to realize that uh, do your homework, but then also, you know, realize how the whole system is structured now. Um, and it's not the 1950s anymore where the doctor would, yay, yay, yay. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, it's not the 1950s anymore where the doctor would spend an hour with the patient. That's just not going to happen. And if a doctor spends that long, you know, like say when, a, when the, when there's a patient emergency in the office, that disrupts the whole office for the whole day. You know, because a patient emergency can take 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Um, they're going to be backed up, you know, for the rest of the day uh, with, with that happening. So, you know, there are limitations with conventional medicine right now. We mm -hmm. hope that some of these things will change, especially after COVID. Because a lot of the reasons why we have so many deaths from COVID is because so many people are on medications and so many people have chronic conditions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and with holistic medicine, we can change a lot of that, but it's going to take a reversal of the thinking that we have in the United States. Mm. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not something that's going to happen overnight, but... Yeah, I just want people to understand it's like apples and oranges. So, you know, holistic medicine is like the orange and then conventional is like the apple and mm -hmm. they are not the same. Mm -hmm. So don't have the same expectations. Okay. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, now you'd mentioned that there's a lot of um, questioning about the, about the entire cell. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, does that... Um, questioning need to occur um um but i mean a, a lot of it one-to-one one to one with the with the so patient or, or or can um a lot of that information be captured through the patient filling out a um oh well, my form. yeah in my practice my my uh practice members fill out a they fill out one set of forms that takes about 30 minutes mm -hmm. when I interview them initially. Um, and that's more of an orientation visit. Mm -hmm. So I'm not assuming care in that visit. Mm -hmm. I'm deciding if we're a good fit and they're deciding if we're a good fit. Okay. And then the next stage is a 45 minute um, electronic um, questionnaire. Mm -hmm. um, and so before the first visit, they fill that out. So in the first visit, we're spending maybe 20 minutes reviewing a little bit of that. So mm -hmm. I, I reviewed it before we meet. Mm -hmm. So I already have an idea of where my questions are, you right. know, not going over the whole thing. I've already gone over it. And I have an idea based on my experience where the important points are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we're looking at a person's life from when they were born until the current time in their history. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. <laughs> so it's very detailed. And that's what it takes to try to reverse a chronic problem. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you have to figure out where in time, where it actually, because the person has an idea of when they started feeling symptoms and started feeling sick. But there's actually some event that happened prior to that. Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that started bringing on the condition. So yeah, it's it's interesting. It's like being a medical detective. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. So, what, what 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 are the leading types of chronic um, conditions you have focused on? So yeah, I see this interview has. <laughs> Sorry, bud. <laughs> no, but it's great. <laughs> uh because uh my uh i'm i'm gonna have a similar type of interview with one of my younger brothers but i i'll go ahead um so um i see a lot of autoimmune issues in my mm -hmm. practice mm -hmm. and especially autoimmune rheumatological issues mm -hmm. uh because uh when i was in chicago at northwestern um, I was part of a multidisciplinary clinic um, where this type of thinking kind of started. It's at the, the Rehab Institute of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And we had a multidisciplinary clinic that had a nurse. We had an acupuncturist. I had started training in functional medicine and my interest lied in nutrition and how to apply that and supplements. So mm -hmm. I was that person, but I'm also a physical medicine and rehab doctor. And I had expertise in the rheumatological um, areas of rehab medicine before I even joined that clinic. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, and we had a rheumatologist who was one of the top rheumatologists in the country, especially with um, rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh participating in that clinic as well. So we would see patients jointly and make up, you know, prescribed plans for patients based on that. Good, good, yeah. all right. So that's what I bring into my practice. I also have um, other autoimmune chronic conditions um, in my practice. I have had people with uh, problems with their thyroid, with their adrenal, and with neurodegenerative problems. Mm -hmm. And because I'm a female doctor, I attract a lot of female patients. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had a lot of high kind of profile uh, female patients um, who have a variety of concerns, but I would say mostly in middle life, um, women start having hormonal issues. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I've had a number of those. Good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks for asking me the question. No problem. Um, I gained a lot. You know? <laughs> so you know. do you have any other questions? No. Not okay. Right now. okay. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank you profusely for doing this with me today. Hey, you're welcome. And um, um, I'm going to um, be publishing it soon. Good, good. So just... Um, uh, let me know when it is uh, viewable. <laughs> okay. 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 